Hello, hello. I am Karen Jean-François, and this is the Women in Data podcast, a podcast where every other week I interview some of the most inspiring women working in data. They discuss how data is used in various industries, share their knowledge and experience in the field, and equip you with tips to help you overcome challenges on your career and feel great. Let's get straight to it. Last week, in the first part of this conversation, Jennifer Agnes, Managing Director at Sinozur Group, spoke about building and maintaining a strong network. Be cognizant about it when you start that conversation with somebody. I mean, they're thinking the same thing you're thinking, right? A lot of the times you think you're alone trying to build your network, but in fact, that other person is like, oh, Karen's a good networking person for me. Let me let me make sure I know. So, so they're in the same boat as you. What I like to do is to be open about it. Hey, this is part of my network. I would love to stay in touch with you. I know it's hard to do that because you're busy and I'm busy, but is it okay if in three months we get on another call or that if in five years, I, I mean, it's kind of a fun conversation to have. Hmm. Five years from now, will you take my call? Ask them that. After having worked as a CDO for companies like Credit Suisse and Schneider Electric, Joining Sinozur gave Jennifer her first role in consulting. There, she supports clients with building data strategies, data capabilities and teams, and support data professionals with career progression through coaching, as well as through the CDO hub. In this episode, she walks you through the steps to build a data strategy and how to identify and address the right business questions to ensure alignment with your business strategy. She provides advice benefiting data professionals at all stages of their career, from recent grads who need to find ways to broaden their perspective as they grow and develop, thinking more broadly and identifying what needs to be done, to senior managers who have to build a strategy that is in line with business objectives and create an environment that encourages sharing ideas, learning every day, and iteratively and continuously create value with data. Thank you so much for staying and then chatting again about your role and how you support data professionals. And something else I wanted to chat with you is around really understanding the business questions or how data and analytics can support businesses and strategy in understanding the real business problems. So this is how we we connected at the beginning. I was thinking so many times we have a question that comes to us and it's not the real question. So what happens is that you end up iterating analysis, iterating work until you get to what the other person is, is trying to get to. And I feel like it's because people don't fully appreciate what the real question is. And I don't know if you've seen, but there are so many articles out there who say that about 90% of data science projects never make it to production or that only 20% of analytics insights, so data insights projects, deliver business outcomes. And that's a shame because there is so much talent there and there are so many things we could do. But because very often we're not able to identify what problem we're trying to solve, it means that all this goes to waste. So I just wanted to have your take on that and maybe have you sharing some tips from business strategy and analytic strategy on how we could really address the, the right question. Yeah, we talked about this. I remember our conversation about this way a few months back, Karen. Let's start with the big picture. Let, let me start there and then we'll dig into what many of us experience um, or have experienced in the past. Setting a data strategy is and has to be tied to the business strategy. You're like, there's really no two ways about it. You've got to understand what you're trying to do to make the business grow. I mean, there's like three things like grow the business, make, make more money, manage costs better, optimize costs, or reduce risk manage risk, right? Those are sort of the three simple levers that we're always trying to strive for, for success. Then there's a bunch of little, a lot of big things underneath them that are itemized about what will measure, how do you measure all of that? 
And a data strategy has to help support those three sort of primary objectives. And that is through what we use as sort of the six pillar approach. Um, We talk about understanding the vision and value that you can get from data. Um, And that is a conversation usually we have with the senior leadership to understand not anything about the data, but what business problems are they trying to solve? And then detecting in that conversation if data can help solve some of those business problems. So that's sort of step one is understanding the vision and value, if you will. That's sort of the first pillar of the data strategy. The second is looking at the people and culture. So the, do you have the capabilities? Do you have the skills in-house? What is the culture around data? Do people understand the value or, or at least put the right words in place to say we need to care about data in a certain way? The third pillar is about how you actually operate. And this is where I think we'll get into the changes in operating models and ways of working so that people who are told what to do actually understand the reason why they're being told what to do versus being order takers, which I think we've lived in in technology and data for a while. Yeah. And then, and then the other, the other three pillars are really around data management, which includes the whole realm of data governance. Um, and data architecture and, you know, cataloging and metadata management and data quality and ethics and privacy and all that stuff around data, how you actually manage the data. The fifth aspect is around technology and architecture and what systems and platforms are going to help you be successful. And then finally, the sixth pillar of this, this roadmap to a data strategy is the roadmap, which is, you know, how to execute and how to sequence the components of the data strategy that are are des- being designed to support the vision and value that you discovered at the beginning of the conversation. Um, so in that, where I think, I don't know if the right term, if that resonates with you, Karen, but feeling like we're receiving an order to get something done, but we don't have the context. Maybe when you're young in your career and you're learning about what you can do and learning some skills, that's a good way to start. Just go do this, work on your technical skills, blah, blah, blah. But the more you progress and the more you realize that you're not uh, isolated in your contribution to what you deliver, that it's connected to everything around you, no matter how small you think your job is, it's got an impact on either upstream, downstream, some adjacency. It helps as you look at the world more broadly. Right. And you start to see like, like, I want to understand why I'm doing that, because I don't think that's the right question to ask, because a lot of the time is what we found out. What I found out is that the technology teams and the data teams know a heck of a lot more about the technology and the data than the business teams, because they're not using the same words, not using the same definitions. We study it every day. We know where things are. We might not have a way to express that to business users just yet because there's no catalog or there's no common language and we haven't gotten the literacy to the right level. I think the need to understand the context starts to drive these new ways of working, which means instead of having the organizational structure dictate what you work on and who you work for, you start looking at the outcome, and then you put the teams on it to deliver the outcome from many different aspects of the organizational structure. So, right, there's an org structure, which is very different from how you operate. You have to have an org structure because of reporting lines and HR and annual reviews and all of the hierarchical stuff that come along with an org structure. But the way you work has to change. And that's the way you start to see the value that you contribute and the outcome to which you can contribute to because it's outcome focused. And that might mean you have a hypothesis that you want to test about a new marketing campaign. And somebody just says to you, hey, Karen, give me the information from last Tuesday's blah, 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 but you don't have the context. When in fact, you have another data set that you think might be more valuable to that outcome. And if they don't allow you to interject that and say, but wait, I think this one might be more meaningful. Can I come into that pod, that group, and talk to you about what other data sets might be available instead of the back and forth, oh, you did it wrong. Oh, well, then here's another data set, right? And that long process that we used to live in, that doesn't make us move very fast. And it isolates and keeps the silos constructed. And and really, it's about breaking down the silos and recognizing the contributions that all of the different capabilities and skills that the people have in your organization can contribute to solving that problem. I think human nature, you gravitate towards 
working on things that interest you. But if you're sort of feel like you're excluded from this really cool project and they're just telling you to give them information or, or do something, it, it's not motivating to today's workforce, right? Especially because you don't see your impact when, it, when it's done that way. Exactly. And people are motivated by impact and feeling that they've contributed or that they're listened to. Even if people don't take on the idea that they've got, they feel like they're part of, again, back to community right? Back mm -hmm. to relationships, feel like it's a safe environment to offer ideas and be constructive, um, super motivational to, to so many people. And I think it's a way of retaining talent these days, right? We see people wanting to be part of so many things. And when they're not, and they're not working in a way that's constructive, they'll move on, right? You're not going to attra attract the digital natives. You're not attracting the talent that you want to help transform your, your ways of working if you keep the old siloed ways of working. I, I say it like it sounds like it's easy to do. It's like the hardest thing to do to get people to work differently, right? I mean, it's hard. Changing behaviors is not uh, <laughs> an easy thing to do at all, especially when you're already comfortable in, in your old ways of, of working. But I think there is something very interesting that you mentioned around when you're early in your career, it's okay to work this way. So it's okay to have someone telling you what to do when you're just doing the, producing the, the output, basically. But then I feel like as you grow in your role, If you're used to to having these micromanagement slash service type of role where there is the, here, I need these, give me that, and then that's what you're doing. But then getting out of that mindset is also a transition that we all have to, to go through. Do you have any tips or advice on how one can move from being, you know, a, a doer to seeing the broader vision of this is the impact I could have with the data and I could approach it in a way that was not briefed uh, to give a better outcome. I, I think part of it is dependent on who your leader is. I said that saying that, you know, that's how I learned some, you know, I didn't, I didn't come out of college knowing how to use Excel. I had to do some modeling or, you know, cash flow analysis and figure out how to use Excel. So it was sort of like, get some skills and get that underway. But the person I worked for was mature enough to know that that wasn't going to be my only skill. So it wasn't, you want to be able to find people that are willing and work for people that are willing to give you a little bit more context. You, you need to ask sometimes. So sometimes it's just going to be, go do it. And it is up to that person, you, the person who is on the receiving end of that, to ask for the context, because that shows your curiosity, that shows your ambition, that shows interest. And most people would not say to you, well, no, that's none of your business. Most people will then stop and say, well, let me tell you what it's for, if they have time. And if they say, I don't have time right now, you do it a little bit later. But again, it's that part about being open and aware and asking for things that are legitimately great questions to help you grow. The worst thing that can happen is they say no, and then you realize maybe that's not the right person to work for. Let me get what I can out of it and, and do the next thing. It reminds me also, I've worked with, with someone from the sales team in the past where, so they asked for something and they didn't have much time to, to explain the context and all these things because they were really short on time for, for pitching. But then after, the pitch, they came back and said, okay, so this is how I incorporated the work that you did in my pitch. And this is how it helped me. And this was the outcome that, that we wanted to have. And that was quite, quite valuable at, at the time to really understand, okay, so I've done that work. This is how it was used. That's a great manager who, who did that for you. I think that's, that's great. There's all sorts of examples, you know, taking the time to talk to people about what they're curious about even just helping that person connect the dots to the work they're doing. I, I can remember trying to, I always call it like drawing the line or pulling the thread from looking at risk ratings we were doing for some transactions back at, at GE and the team that was doing the, the risk reporting. What we started talking about was, you know, that's a really hard job and there's a lot of detail and it's very detailed and sort of why am I doing it? Well, you know, you have to do it for the company, but you could actually see in the annual report where their information 
landed in the annual report that everybody in the world was looking at, right? And yeah. it made them feel like they were part of the greater organization and they contributed, even if it's on page 77 of the annual report, they can see their connection to that and they feel like they have some you know, contribution and the whole team could look at that. So it's ways of pulling that thread and and connecting the dots for people so that they feel part of the greater the good that you're you're trying to to achieve, right? Thanks for sharing that. Before we close the episode, can I ask you to share maybe some resource that you read or listen to to help you in your career development? Well, I listen to a lot of podcasts, obviously. This one and um, the one that Sinister Pope has as well. It's called the Hub and Spoken Podcast. It was actually, I think it's probably one of the first data type podcasts because it started long before the pandemic. It's really great. It's actually how I found Sinister as well um, in, in the past. A lot of data stuff. I listened to another podcast that's completely different that, to data, but a brilliant podcast called Making Sense by Sam Harris. I don't know if you know that one. I'm sort of obsessed. I don't know that one. Uh, just every topic you can imagine, intellectual, smart, makes you think. I, I listen to that a lot when I'm driving because then you can just think and get creative instead of sitting in front of the computer and, and looking at data stuff. So that's one that's really outside of my uh, data space. I do a lot of reading from New York Times articles, all that kind of stuff, but also historical fiction. And I really like that because the art of storytelling from a fiction, but a historical fiction perspective is really interesting to me. I learned so much about the history, but then there's a story that makes you remember the history. And it's very similar to what we have to do in data. How to tell the story about data when people don't really care about hearing about the data part, but what's the story that goes with it? So I draw that likeness between telling the story about history versus reading a history book. That's sort of how I think about data. That's that's brilliant. I love that. And actually, you know, Hub and Spoken, Alison Williams from Denham B, with whom we had an episode, I think it was in September, actually mentioned the the podcast and that's how I came across that podcast. So oh. yeah, thanks for sharing it as well. I was on that podcast. I think mine is episode 55. We now have over a hundred of it. So I was on it probably a year and a half ago talking about data leadership there too. So you can find mine if you want. If you haven't listened yeah. To it. <laughs> yeah. I actually listened to it. I remember. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. Thank you so much for joining me on the podcast today. My pleasure, Karen. It was really great. Thank you for having me. This is our last episode for the year. Thank you so much for listening to the podcast and for all the support received in 2021. We will be back in January with celebrations for the episode 50. Yes, we already have 50 episodes. This is exciting. And there will be a prize to win. So stay tuned. And until then, Merry Christmas and Happy New Year. Thank you for listening to the Women in Data podcast. We will be back in a couple of weeks with a new guest. Until then, if you have two minutes, it would be great if you could leave us a rating or a review as it helps not only to make the podcast more visible, but also to enhance the content. If you don't want to miss the next episode, follow us on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. We are also on LinkedIn. And if you wish to, you can even register to the community for free. All you have to do is head to womenindata.co.uk. Have a great day.